they're literally living in our houses. They're literally using the furniture that our parents grew up with. This is Max Rameau, strategist, theorist, author, and organizer with Pan-African Community Action, and you are listening to The Next World, a podcast about building movements. Once a month on this show, we will explore and celebrate the work of poor people's movements, particularly in the U.S. We will highlight innovative and powerful organizing campaigns and community building led by women, LGBTQ folks, black communities, and other people of color that are pushing the boundaries and have the potential to transform this society. Today on the show, we talk to Aisha Ahmed, an organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement and the International League of People's Struggle. Together, we look at the current struggle in Palestine and how it connects to the fight against fascism, Black Palestinian solidarity, and the path to liberation. All right. So, Aisha, thank you so much for joining us. We have a lot to get into, but I want to start out with you, actually. So can you talk a little bit about what your path was to activism? How did you get into uh, organizing, into activism, into the, uh, the type of extra work that a lot of people don't really do? Thank you so much for that question, Max. It's great to be here. I would say that I identify as an organizer, not an activist. That's really foundational to our movement culture in the Palestinian youth movement. But I I grew up in the movement. So my dad, I was raised by a single father. He came to the United States right after the first Intifada. He was active um, during the uprisings. And so In, uh, in Palestine. In Palestine, yes, and then to fall the first intifada in Palestine in the West Bank. I come from um, Bethlehem area, so Walaja, which is a little village right outside of Bethlehem. And he came to the United States, and he was a he he became like kind of a a real grassroots organizer. Which you know, I was a young kid after nine eleven, and so uh, in single father fashion, he would bring me to all of the protests and kind of just let me do my own thing. I mean, he would let me be on the other side of the street and I was the kid that was supposed to fly her. And so um, I dealt with a lot of Zionists from a really young wow. age. Uh, something that no one would allow, right? Like that is such a single dad thing. I always tell that story because <laughs> dad, how the heck did you allow me to just stand up there by myself? And yeah, and he would take me back to the West Bank in the summers. So I spent I spent my you know summer months in Ida refugee camp, which was, you know, remnants of the second intifada at that time, right? So I experienced Zionist repression in the United States and back home. And I think that it just led me down this trajectory where there was no other option but to be an organizer. Yeah. So let me just say to your to your dad, letting your daughter uh uh, be in an environment where they could be accosted by uh, angry Zionists really just makes me look like a much better parent. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> no, but I think it's great, of course, that 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 uh, he took you. And I, of course, took uh, uh, my oldest son in particular, both of my children. I've taken them to events and, and things and, you know, a little bit let them run wild, but also a little bit had them had, had some work to do. So I really appreciate uh, that and how they brought uh, brought you there. I also appreciate your distinction that you're making, which I don't think is made enough here between organizer and activist. Uh, so, what do you see as the key difference between the uh, between the two, particularly in this context? You know, I I understand an organizer as someone who is not just able to put on a hat and take it off. You know, this isn't something that I'm paid for. I'm not. I don't work in a nonprofit. This is like a like, you know, there's a revolutionary foundation to it. And so, um, yeah, I think that it's just the commitment and the um, identity of being an organizer is someone that I am 24 seven, right? Like in whatever space that I'm a part of, I have to make sure that I am that, right? Yeah, for me, in my mind, I think the, the, the difference is who you're coming with. So if you're going to a protest, you're definitely activist. Even if you're putting together a protest, but if you're coming with a bunch of people that you had to convince to get there, then you're an organizer. I don't want to oversimplify it. I think that to me, that's it, is, is who are you bringing there? And then what are you talking about after you leave? Like, I think that's the the the, the big difference. And there's plenty of activists who can go to it. And I think it's important. I'm not saying this to uh, to be negative on activists. There are plenty of people who can go to a protest and then afterwards uh, leave as if, and you would never know they've been there. But I think an organizer care, I think to your point of, of it being with you 24 seven, carries it with them. And then is talking to, uh, talking to people about it afterwards. So uh, if after you go to the event, you go to the restaurant and you talk about sports, then, you know, this is not saying that as an insult, you're an activist. If you go to the restaurant and you're talking to your server about the protests you were just at, you might be an organizer. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that distinction. It's the, it's the difference around base building. Yeah. 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 yeah I think yeah, so. Yeah. So what is right now you're in the Bay area. 
I right? am. I live yeah. in Oakland. You live in Oakland. And so what is the political landscape there specifically around uh, organizing around uh, uh, issues like uh, the liberation of Palestine? So I am in the Palestinian youth movement. Um, We're a transnational grassroots youth led organization. We have chapters um, in Britain, Italy, Sweden, all over Canada, the United States. But the first uh, chapter of the Palestinian youth movement outside of the Middle East was actually founded right here in the Bay oh. Area. So we have a huge legacy. I stand on the, you know, the backs of giants, right? But yeah, I would say that Palestinian organizing scene out here is significantly different than what I came from when I was raised in Seattle. I only moved out to Oakland about a year and a half ago to uh, go to San Francisco State for my ethnic studies program. But here, I mean, it's like, the joint struggle is felt in every facet of my life. You walk down the street and there's murals of Palestine, Black and Palestinian solidarity, um, Filipino Palestinian solidarity. I would say that it's just it's present everywhere you go. The support of the Palestinian liberation Zionism is really put in a corner over here. And so it's been beautiful. Yeah, but that's not the case everywhere, uh, certainly not in the United States, uh, uh, much less the, the the world. What do you think contributed to creating that political space? I see two prongs to it, right? There's the history of just organizing in general in Oakland, right? Mm-hmm. Black Panther movement, AIM, standing up for what's right, being a part of national liberation struggles here is just prominent across the board. On the other end, like there's a huge hub of Arabs in Oakland, Um, And there always has been. And so I think that it's easier to build a base out here and to actually be able to have mass mobilizations. And I think the people power is is felt right is felt through the government, through our institutions. And so we were able to build something a lot bigger than we were able to build in Seattle. I can see that. So let's talk a little bit about uh, shift, shift, not too much shifting gears, but shift a little bit ge- geographically and talk about Palestine itself. So in March of 2023, uh, we saw a lot of uptake. I mean, obviously in this, uh, uh, in the, the Palestinian conflict, we call, we call it the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, it's been uh, ongoing at times it's very hot at and at other times it's simmering beneath the surface. But we certainly have seen a a significant uptick in March uh, of 2023, and it looks like it's just going to continue. So can you just talk about what's been happening over the past few months, March included, but what has really led up to March? What what has been going on that has caused um, the the conflict to escalate? And I just also want to be clear, I'm I'm saying the conflict escalated because I want to be kind of in some way scientific about it, but it really is, you know, on one side, it's people throwing rocks uh, and throwing what you could really call fireworks. And on the other side, tanks and actual bombs falling out of uh, out of uh, jets. Uh, and these, yeah. this, this is a slaughter from one side from the Israeli side over towards and directed at the Palestinians. But what has led to this escalation that's been going on uh, since early 2023? Yeah, I really appreciate your clarification there, because I think the the use of the term conflict is uh, overused, it's simplified, and it negates the reality of what settler colonialism and occupation actually is, right? Mm-hmm. Like we are, we are a grassroots, you know, mass movement, basically, of different factions using rocks and like homemade, whatever you want to call it, against a nuclear power, right? Like we know, we know Israel is produces weaponry that they able, are able to like sell to the entire world. Uh, it really is one of genocide, of occupation, of destruction. And so I, I really pre- appreciate you saying that. Um, this past year has been one of the bloodiest years that we have seen for the Palestinian people. There were over 3,000 injured um, in confrontation with the Israeli occupation forces. Um, we've had over 35 Palestinians killed just in the past couple months. We have. Uh, and and we by just comparison, have, can, how many Israelis have been killed on the other side? That's a good question. I actually don't know the but, um, exact from, number. From what I've seen, it's been either four or six. I yeah. So, I, so it's by which is which is pretty high relative. You know, re, which is which is really high uh, compared to previous escalations. I mean, I've seen them where there's been a couple hundred Palestinians and one Israeli, and even that that the, the way that they've described it, that the, you know, it's like questionable, like a car accident as a result of something. But yes, I, I but I from the numbers that I've seen, it's roughly six to thirty six, uh, which is you know uh, uh, by a you know, by exponentially greater by six times. So this is not a a, a fair fight. 
No, it's not. It's not. I mean, there's also been an exponential increase in not just like Israeli occupation violence, but also settler violence. So we saw in Huwada, which is a village next to Nablus, that um, settlers invaded and burned down over 100 homes and cars just last month. Right. There's been like there's been settler violence and just like individual like fights in the street. Um, and and I think to give the landscape to some of the viewers here, right, like all of Israel is a settler colonial nation, but based on the 67 borders, there is technically territory, quote unquote, that should be controlled and governed by Palestinians alone. But because Israel is trying to creep and take more land, um, they have placed settlements within the West Bank. So for example, in my village, to go from Walajda, we are blocked on one side by the occupation's wall. And then on the other side, we are boxed in by a settlement. So to basically get out from my village to the main city, we have to go down a road where, you know, settlers are there and there's able to be confrontation. So things have um, exponentially increased. And I think that that's a result of what we're seeing within the Zionist regime's uh, political sphere, which we can get yeah. into later. But um, on the other end, like we've seen mass mobilizations of the Palestinian people. So Palestinian factions are aligning in a way that we haven't seen since the first Intifada, um, which we call the Joint Operation Room. So all of our Pal Palestinian resistance factions are coordinating with each other um, to respond to all of the attacks by um, the new fascist government that's rising in Israel. So um, in the prisoner movement, for example, which, you know, for us, our political prisoners really set the tone for our movement, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, we face a 99.97% conviction rate in Israeli military detention. And um, if you're taken to jail, it's kind of seen as an honor because you're only taken to jail if you are active in our political struggle. Right. You know, it's, it's the best of our people who are in these prisons. And they organized a mass hunger strike that was supposed to start on the beginning of Ramadan, which would be over 2,000 people um, basically agreeing to go on hunger strike for the entirety of Ramadan until their uh, demands were met. This was coordinated by all the different political factions that were present within the prisoner um, within the prisoner system. And uh, Israel had to concede the day beginning of Ramadan, right when it started, they, uh, they conceded and all the demands were met and the prisoners did not have to go on hunger strike. So wow. yeah, it's been... Um, it's been a bloody year, but it's also been a year of mass mobilization and unity. And yeah. I think that the Palestinian people are excited for what's to come. Yeah, I, you know, I think on on the uh, on the first it's, a, it's it's an incredible victory, and I'm uh, uh, really unhappy that we're not hearing more about things like this because if it were in reverse, if we had uh, either Israelis who were going on hunger strike, or if we had the Ukrainians who were going on hunger strike, uh, you know, there's just a whole number of scenarios where you imagine that you would have we would have heard a lot more about it. But I think also back to your point about the uh, the importance of language here uh, and and uh, conflict in particular. You know, if someone broke into your house and they have a gun at you, and you have your hands up because you don't want to get shot. Then at that point, you know, to the outside observer, they could say, "Well, there's no conflict." But then as soon as you start to fight back to try to get the person out of your house and you're knocking over furniture and you're knocking over, you know, uh, uh, lampshades and things like that, then suddenly it could look like there's a conflict and calling it a conflict at that point really, really does seem, and even though I was trying to use it in a scientific uh, sense, I, you know, your, your words made me see that really does not very scientific. Like if I was, if I was trying to fight off a, a, a burglar, an invader into my home, that would not be the beginning of the conflict. And if I didn't fight it off, it wouldn't mean there's no conflict. It would just mean that I realized there's a gun to my head. So yeah, I just want to, you know, I want to thank you for, for doing that. So I think one of the things that's happening a little bit differently this time with this uh, uh, rise in in, uh, in violence is that people are starting to recognize, particularly in the U.S., uh, that this is not just a bunch of terrorists in Palestine, uh, and then uh, the Israeli government is protecting the, its poor innocent people. This is actually state-sponsored terrorism on the part of the uh, uh, Israeli government. So uh, many new people are, it seems, are seeing this type of. Uh, conflict in a uh, in a different way. Uh, again, using the word conflict here, but it's seeing this in a different way. At least that's the way I perceive it. Do you think that's true? And if it is true, why do you think that's so different today than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, today, if you were to ask me, I think that it has so much to do from the mass mobilizations that we had in 2021 around Mm -hmm. Sheikh Jarrah. I think that that was one of the um, moments where the Palestinian people had the most international attention that we've seen since the Second Intifada. Sheikh Jarrah, it was a village outside of Jerusalem that was being taken over by settlers, essentially. That was a settler takeover. Yes. uh Right. Yes. 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 Okay. And and there was plenty of videos because the person who was actually taking the home of um, Mohammed al-Kurt was um, a guy named David from New York City. And so I think that it was really hard for the media to twist this when yes. the whole like international community is saying, you know, clearly this is a white settler, not like from the United States who just moved there and is now kicking a Palestinian out of their home. Right. Um, and so the media had a really hard time shifting that narrative. Uh, and when we say time. settler, it's a term often used, but but uh, I, I'm not sure that it resonates with you. It really literally is, you have a Palestinian family in their home and they go to work in the morning and when they come back in the evening, there is now an Israeli family living in their house and they're saying, this is now our house. That is literally what's happening, right? And that's what happened with this case with, with, with David and the uh, displaced New, New York and Yes. Yes, it did. I mean, um, and it's crazy. I think that people don't realize, you know, like the state of Israel is uh, younger than my grandma. Right. So um, when we're talking about settler colonialism, this isn't, you know, something of the past, which a lot of people try and frame settler colonialism as something, you know, we're in a post-colonial society. I actually disagree with that. I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, settler colonialism is constantly expanding. We live in a settler colonial state, but nonetheless, like that, that logic isn't even feasible in Israel because they're literally living in our houses. They're literally using the furniture that our parents, you know, grew up with. Like it is, yeah, it's, it's not different. Right, right, right. And it's happening today in real time. And this is not some faraway thing where you're having some abstract discussion about, you know, where the pilgrims, uh, you know, what was the role of the pilgrims and were they really good? This is actually things happening. Or did they understand it at that time? This is today, modern day, and and, and we know that people understand the, the difference. So we're having uh, uh, on the... Uh, uh, on the Israeli side, you have a government that is uh, is attacking with real ferocity a, a group of people who don't have access to basic means of, of, of self-defense while they're occupying uh, land. And then they're doing this to defend uh, individuals who are moving into homes that, that are already lived in, like not even that they were lived in two weeks ago, but that are already lived in today. Uh, so this is the this is the thing that's happening on the Israeli side. What is happening on the Palestinian side? How are people resisting? How are people uh, organizing uh, in response to this growing uh, this growing surge of, of, of uh, uh, Israeli violence? So I think that we've seen a change in the last five to 10 years since Oslo, which is when the United States brokered a deal between the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the Israeli occupation to basically recognize the Palestinian territories while we would give up any sort of uh, resistance, right? So we were not able, we were recognized, but we had no self-governance. And at the time, this was really controversial. There were people who were so insistent on getting statehood that they really, truly believed that this recognition was something in their benefit. And we have seen since Oslo that, you know, this this was an act of capitulation, essentially. Right. And so I would say within the last five to 10 years, we are now reclaiming our right to resist. And we are understanding that unity is the only way that we are going to be able able to combat Israel as the foothold of imperialism for the United States and the Middle East, right? Like this is a a really important stronghold that imperialist powers are trying to maintain. So we have to align ourselves, even if it's been difficult, right? It's been difficult for us as Palestinians. And so um, I would say that it's the popular uprisings and it's the the resistance is how we have been um, coordinating. And do you think this is going to, this resistance that's happening, this popular uprising that that is uh, bubbling up right now, is this the beginning of a new intifada? Is this the beginning of a new mass movement? I sure hope so, Max. I sure hope so. (laughs) I feel like everybody's done with me saying, oh my God, is this the next intifada? But I I sure hope so, because that's how we achieve our liberation, right? So... I hope so. I think what makes this moment incredibly unique is also what we've been seeing within the Zionist regime. So um, the Israeli government is collapsing in front of our eyes. There is, uh, to break it down, the Knesset is divided into 120 different... Knesset being the Congress of the Israeli government. 
Yes, essentially. So um, they have 120 seats and they have different political parties that are represented in it. Um, because there are so many different political parties, they have had to create blocks. There is the right wing block and there is the left wing block. And those blocks basically form coalitions so that they can win a majority vote because you can't pass anything without 51 percent. So because no party, it's not like the United States where there's two parties, there's seven, eight, nine parties. And so they have to get together in these blocks that pass one thing or another by voting together. But they also make are constantly trading horse trading in order to get these votes passed. Absolutely. And so um, Netanyahu represents the right wing bloc and the right wing bloc is completely is unaligned. Right. So the right wing bloc in like includes the Likud party. It includes religious Zionism, the United Torah, Otsma Yehud, um, et cetera. And within this, like there are, you know, Ben Gavir, there is Smotrich, there are like real fascist genocidal fanatics Mm -hmm. um, advocating for the complete genocide of all of Palestinians and showing up in in Europe, for example, Smotrich just gave a presentation in in Europe and literally had a a flag on the front of his podium, uh, or sorry, a map on the front of his podium that was supposed to show the new state of Israel, which was Israel, parts of Jordan, and Syria. Yeah. uh, So it's expansion. Right. And this is stuff they're calling for openly. This is not some kind of big secret. This is uh, particularly the 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 you know what would what would be a genocide of the of the Palestinians, right? They're calling for this openly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and at the same time, you know, right, what what Netanyahu is trying to do, because this is now his sixth time being elected mm-hmm. <laughs> prime minister. Yeah. Um, and so what he is really trying to do is create as many reforms as possible to maintain control of the whole entire government through the Knesset, literally disposing of his own people from his own bloc to do so. Uh, yeah. which is what we've seen has created the uprisings in Israel. I'm sure you have seen it all over the news, right? I think it was over 10% of the Israeli population was in the street mm-hmm. uh, protesting against this quote unquote fascist government, which is yeah. uh, the contradiction is infuriating for us as Palestinians. Also, it's a, it's a real opportunity for our resistance. Mm-hmm. And you know, Israel's aware of that and we're aware of that. And uh, the rest of the region is aware of that. So, you, you know, it certainly is a real opportunity. I will say, though, that, if you know, if you're retelling that exact same story you just did about how these far right forces are cannibalizing their own uh, and moving them out in order to consolidate their power and how they're just becoming more and more extreme and basically calling for genocide in their fashion. I mean, you could just as easily be describing right now the Republican Party in the United States. Uh, the similarities are just striking. Uh, I don't think, however, the Republican Party is, is falling apart. It still continues to get 48, 49, sometimes more than that percent of the the, the, the vote uh, throughout the United States. And then, of course, there's, there are states in which, it, in the same way, the Likud Party is 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 close to calling for a genocide, it seems, uh, at least as, as, its, as its public position, uh, even though individual members have already done that. And um, they're still getting votes. They're not getting kicked out. They are not saying there's no no protest that's happening from some of the other parties there. They're still getting votes. And it's also infuriating for folks who are here, uh, who who are saying, you know, the nerve of of these people, you have Democrats who are complaining about right-wing Republicans, but who are very happy to live on stolen land here and uh, and embrace all the contradictions and support uh, uh, Israel at the same time. You know, who are doing that against certain kinds of police repression here, but are fully for funding it uh, overseas. So I think we're seeing really real similarities here. If you have to wonder, is this happening in the West in general? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they're not understanding the link between our, you know, um, security forces, right? Yeah. And the, yeah, and just the, right, exactly the link between the security force and the way that those security forces see people inside. We'll talk about that in a second also. But when I say that on, on, on this area of, of what's happening and particularly the U.S. brokered Oslo agreement that happened uh, a, a few years back, uh, that did happen a few years back. And there was this, you, you know, reduction in conflict or overt conflict anyway. It was just converted into a lower level conflict. Recently, recently, meaning the same uh, in March of, of this year, it was a surprise to many, and it has not made a lot of news, but China brokered a, a truce, brokered a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. What are the chances that China is then, instead of the U.S., is at the center of, a, of the next peace deal between uh, the Palestinians and the uh, Israeli government? 
Oh, wow. You know, that is, <laughs> that is something that I haven't heard yet. I don't think that that is coming. I don't think that the Palestinian people will be fooled by a peace deal anymore. I think that we're over the uh, framing of apartheid. And I think that people are really rooted in, um, you know, for lack of better words, land back, right? Mm -hmm. um, a complete pa free Palestine from the river to the sea and nothing we, we will not normalize anymore. What the yeah. Palestinian Authority may do is, you know, for their own financial gain is something that I can't, I can't speculate Control on. Control or predict, yeah. Yeah, because they'd be doing some crazy, crazy stuff out here. Um, but would that represent where the vast majority of the Palestinian people are? Absolutely not. <laughs> You talked a little bit about how I asked if if this was the the beginning of the next uh, uh, intifada, and you you know you said you hope so. It looked like it was, it was happening, but uh, while the the Israel was expanding in the uh, in the sixties uh, in in nineteen sixty seven with the war that that uh, allowed them to take over the Gaza and the West Bank, uh, where they seized that land, they they fought war in order to get that. Uh, get that land. At the same time, the Black Power movement in the United States was also was kicking up a gear, was emerging, was separating itself, distinguishing itself from the civil rights movement and uh, 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 and advancing. And during that time, the Black Panther Party uh, talked about Palestine and the importance of the links between the two. Malcolm X actually visited during his lifetime as well. During one of his trips there, he visited uh, Gaza. Uh, so it seemed like there was a legacy. Uh, back then, of movements that were happening in Palestine to resist against Zionist imperialism, and in the U.S. to resist what many of us in the more radical elements of the of the uh, of the Black movement called uh, an internal or domestic colony, uh, where the United where they were, the United States government was colonizing Black people, it, and and you're thinking that this could be the next Intifada, and I'm thinking this moment with all these protests and all this resistance happening in the U.S., this could be the next Black Power movement. So what are the, do you, do you think that there is a real connection happening here? Is there a legacy that is continuing today? And if so, what are the, what are the, I guess, the prospects for us seeing that a bit more clearly today, even though it seems like we saw it pretty clearly in the late 60s? That's a great question. That's a really beautiful question, because I think that the way that people talk about Black and Palestinian solidarity or um, the links between Black and Palestinian liberation is really centered around the way that our oppressors exchange tactics and um, you know, oppress us and surveil us and control us. But at the same time, our resistance movements are completely aligned. And we've seen that even through the Ferguson uprising. We've seen that through um, uprisings after George Floyd. How, was, how have we seen it in the Ferguson uprising? Can you be more specific so, about how we saw during police killing in Ferguson, Missouri, and Palestinians. I love telling the story because I was actually in Palestine uh, during the war on Gaza and the war on Ferguson is how I describe it. And so um, I was in the West Bank and basically on our TV 24 seven, um, we were just flipping between channels that were broadcasting Ferguson and Gaza. The Palestinian people, like we were, we, you know, we were convinced that essentially the, all of the United States looked like Ferguson because that's all that we <laughs> Right. And so um, there were young men who would be going to the Internet cafes, which is basically like, you know, little cafes with with a bunch of computers. Um, and they would be sending over information on how to deal with tear gas, how to send it over to their comrades in the United States in, in Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah. In Ferguson, you know, and um, that was something that was actually being talked about in the streets in Palestine. And I did not realize was going to be such a moment of black Palestinian solidarity. It's now mm. have been documented by plenty of scholars, yeah. but um, it was real. And it was something that we were we were engaged in. You know, it was really start coming back to the United States because I remember flying back into Seattle and getting out of the airport and it was a beautiful sunny day. And I was like, where are the tanks? Where is the gas? Like I had really expected to step into Ferguson and people were like, what are you talking about? And I said, do you not know what's happening in Ferguson right now? And, you know, comrades who I'm really ashamed to say are, you know, they didn't know at that point because that's how like disconnected people, even within the Imperial Corps are from each other. Mm. Uh, I felt much more connected to the struggle back in Palestine than I did literally here um a quick flight away so yeah wow 
And also there was a very high profile, anyway, uh, uh, organizer and activist, Basim Mazri, who who was on the front lines of the Ferguson protests. And then he died a few years later of a heart attack, and this was publicly said. But that was also a, a place where, we, where there was direct connections uh, and people were able to make those connections by knowing someone personally who was identifying with this Black movement because he identified with the exact same situation, what he saw as the exact same situation uh, in, in, in Palestine as well. So I think on, on that point, then, we've seen some um, uh, some solidarity of, of, of Palestinians to uh, the Black liberation movements here, contemporary Black liberation movements here uh, in the United States, as well as historic, uh, uh, historic ones. Uh, are there any other areas where you've seen that? Have you seen it in reverse also, do you think that Black people here in the United States are thinking more and more about what is happening in Palestine? Oh, I know it. Oh, I um, I lived it. I think that that's what actually, um, I will say that Black and Filipino comrades are what brought me to my anti-imperialist uh, roots foundation, mm. my political development. As opposed to just pro-Palestinian. You, yeah. You, in other words, yeah, yeah. Grew your consciousness from just thinking about my village to thinking about what, what is imperialism and how does it relate to you? And what is internationalism? What is true oh. international solidarity with one another? It was during the George Floyd uprisings that a huge portion of the West Bank was about to be annexed. And so um, Palestinians called for a day of rage. And this fell within the preceding months. I cannot remember the exact day, but you know we had over 100 days of uh, protests after George Floyd's death in Seattle, right? So in one of those 100 days, there was a call for a day of rage on the Palestinian side. And all of our Black comrades who we had been organizing with day and night basically decided to shift the narrative of their protest and throw down for our day of rage mm -hmm. and highlight the ways that uh, surveillance is being exchanged, weaponry is being exchanged, uh, you know, trainings are being done to the Seattle Police Department by the Israeli military occupation forces. Wow. And we had a protest outside of the Seattle precinct and we walked to the ADL office, the Anti-Defamation League's office, and they taught us so much of our security protocols. Um, they really like, I mean, like I learned how to be an organizer, I feel like overnight with them. And um, we launched our End the Deadly Exchange campaign and they continue to throw down for us, you know, far beyond when the protests were over after George Floyd. And so there was just this like exchange of, I mean, it was just actually, I don't want to say it's an exchange. It was just a truly deep relationship that we had mm. all built with each other. When you talk about internationalism and you're uh, talking about imperialism, obviously there's a, uh, uh, there's a, only a few actors that could like not every country, even if they want to be one, can be an imperialist <laughs> power, right? You know, you Absolutely. just don't have that kind of juice. Uh, what is the role of the U.S. Uh, in the oppression and exploitation uh, and the stealing of the land of, of the Palestinians? And then what does that mean for those of us who are living in the U.S.? So I was born in Haiti. Uh, the U.S. government, of course, has has uh, invaded and, and um, occupied Haiti a number of times and looks like it's on the verge of doing so again. I would not be surprised if they did, although we're, we're trying to, 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 to resist that. I would not be surprised they gave it a shot uh, again this year. And so I'm living here watching my tax dollars, as you mentioned earlier, go, watching my tax dollars go to, to pay for this. And you're living here and you're watching your tax dollars go to, do we have a special role? What is our role here? What is our responsibility when we're here in the United States living, even though we're simultaneously victims and perpetrators, it seems like, of this uh, of this violence? Yeah, I mean, I think that you're kind of answering your own question as we ask it, because, you know, I, I think it really comes down to positionality. The United States gives Israel more money than any other country in the world, excluding Ukraine this year, we should we should say. But <laughs> historically, America gives Israel more money than any other country in the world. And so um, it's a real grim reality to know that, you know, when I pay my taxes, I'm basically funding the genocide of my own family. And so I think that you're right, that there's arguments about what constitutes an imperialist power, but um, at the end of the day, we are in the imperial core. That's not up for debate, in my opinion. And we have we have a role at dismantling and cutting, at least severing the ties between this nation and um, the Zionist regime as much as possible. And that should be the the primary focus of all of our organizing, because that's 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 where we're at, right? Uh, I think it also makes me think as you're as you're you know talking about recognizing the way in which 
uh, your living here is funding the uh, uh, the genocide uh, of your of your community. I, I you know oftentimes feel the same way when I'm paying taxes and I'm like you know this money is paying the salary and then the criminal defense fund of the cop who just killed somebody. And then, so how do we get out of that? I think that's a, a, a constant uh, emotional, but also real political question is how do we get out of this trap that we're in where we're paying for the things that we're protesting? And so we're we see like in, in some ways, real ways, we're on both sides of the, of the same issue. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes into the boycott, divest, and sanctions campaign, at least within the Palestinian context. There, there is the economic mobilizations that we can have. There is the economic like hand that we can have, and there's also the you know the popular uprising, the shift of narrative, the like highlighting of international solidarity, which is where I focus most of my energy. And, and I and I will say, you know, to be really transparent, BDS is an important movement. It's an important tool and tactic for us to use as Palestinians, but um, it is the floor, it's not the ceiling. You know, it is the bare minimum that we can do um, is is try and, you know, not buy Sabra hummus, not buy Tivas or whatever, L'Oreal is, uh, you know, being created by Israelis on Israeli settlements um, in the West Bank, right? But I, I think that that's too often where the conversation starts and where the conversation ends. And um, really, you know, BDS is not going to be successful if it's just individuals. It's it's corporations that are funding this. It's corporations that have the power. It's the government that has, you know, the funding for this. And so no matter how much we convince people to stop buying all of these different products, we're not going to have the impact unless we're able to organize together and target, you know, corporations, et cetera. And so, Yeah. I feel like you keep finding a way to bring organizing back into this. <laughs> yeah. All right. So speaking of organizing, how can people find out more about your work? How can people support your work? And, and that will be support of uh, obviously not just you individually, but of the Palestinian youth movement and the International League of People Struggle. Is that the, the yes. other formation? Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 yes. I am a part of the International League of People Struggle. Um, We are the largest anti-imperialist coalition internationally with over 350 member orgs, um, country chapters across the globe. And so it was birthed out of the Philippines and um, we are growing a strong anti-imperialist and internationalist movement here. Uh, You can find us on Instagram at ILPS underscore US for the US chapter. And you can find the Palestinian Youth Movement on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook at the Palestinian Youth Movement. Great. Aisha, thank you so much for your work and thank you so much for sharing information on this very timely issue. And I think we'll be seeing each other in the streets. Absolutely, we will. Thank you, Max. Okay, that's our show. Thank you for listening to The Next World. I'm Max Rameau. You can find out more about my work at pacapower.org. That's P-A-C-A power.org. You can read more in depth on many of the issues that we talked about today on the Partners for Dignity and Rights website, dignityandrights.org. We'll be back with another episode of The Next World soon. Until then, please tell your friends about us and help us spread the word about this podcast. Bye for now, and remember, organize, organize, organize.